going, guys. There you go. There you go. Happy Halloween. Kevin Deal here, and on today's episode, we're going to be doing a review of the Siri 50mm 1.8 anamorphic lens. Welcome to today's episode. If you're not familiar with Kevin Deal Photography, we do gear reviews tips, techniques, and tutorials, and sometimes we dive into film. If any of that sounds appealing to you, click the subscribe button below. So I've been a stills photographer for years, and just recently I've been getting more into cinematography. In the process of learning how to do cinematography, I have fallen in love with the look of anamorphic lenses. If you're watching today's episode and you don't know what an anamorphic lens is, I'll explain that to you right now. So when you look at this anamorphic lens right here, something may stand out that's a little obvious to you if you're used to shooting stills and you're used to shooting on traditional spherical lenses. When you look at an anamorphic lens like this, you'll see that it has a square on the front element. And then if you look a little closer, you'll see some oval shaped elements in the front. When you use your typical uh, spherical lens, you see circles all around. That's because all the elements are circular. Uh, that's not the case with a anamorphic lens. There are circular elements in the back, but the front uses more oval shaped elements, which end up squeezing your image. And I'll explain to you why in just a moment. But it's important to know uh, why people choose to shoot on anamorphic lenses. So my introduction to the anamorphic look was in Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, which by the way, my controversial take is that Deckard is a much cooler hero than Han Solo. Flame me in the comments. It was the first time I ever became aware that, wow, cinematography is this beautiful art and like this is just so amazing to look at. That seed was planted and it grew and grew and grew. Now here I am holding a 50 millimeter 1.8 anamorphic lens in my hand. So uh, the reason why cinematographers would choose an anamorphic look is they want to get like more of a painterly look on the outer edges, more fall off. Um, they want something unique like lens flares, that J.J. Abrams look, uh, and more of a Jimmy effect because they are less sharp than traditional spherical lenses. Uh, they also love it because, as I'd mentioned earlier, uh, it squeezes your image and you'll take it into post-production. Uh, this is a one point three, three times uh, squeeze. So when you take it into something like Premiere Pro, you'll de-squeeze it at a 1.33. It'll give you that 2.4 by one cinemascope look, that widescreen look that you become so accustomed to, and it looks cinematic. So that is why people are drawn to the anamorphic look. Something to keep in mind about this lens is that it is completely manual, which is normal for cinema lenses. The focus poles need to be smooth, they need to be very organic, and that is usually done by hand. Uh, you can put gears uh, on the outer edge of this lens. I'll get into a little bit on that later. Uh, you have a maximum aperture of f1.8, as the name suggests, and it goes all the way down to f16. The lens is a little over four inches. It's at about 1.25 pounds. The lens structure is 11 elements in eight groups. The focus ring is 143 degrees to get from one end to the other. And it has a very common filter thread size of 67 millimeters, which is good because uh, you can go get your favorite ND filter uh, and put it on the end. And if you want it to be variable or fixed, that's up to you. But uh, that's a common filter thread size, which is a good thing. If you're new to the cinema world, you may notice that this lens doesn't come with a lens hood. That's actually perfectly normal and standard practice in the world of cinema. The reason why is that you'll go out and purchase an accessory called a map box, which gives you barn doors as well as a slot to put different lens filters into. And that is the way they do things in the cinema world. I'll leave a link in the description below where you can pick one up. 
So this lens is an APS-C lens, but don't freak out if you're on full frame. Maybe you own a Canon R5. I own a Canon R5, and I use this on my R5. I also use it on my R7, but you can put your R5 in crop mode. You can also use this on an R5C. You can also use this on something like a, a C70. You're totally fine using this uh, on any of those cameras. You just need to know what modes you need to be in. So if you shoot at 1.6 crop on the uh, R5, you'll of course take it into post-production, squeeze it out, and it'll all look correct in post-production, just like it does when you do it on the R7. Real quick, here is the process of how you de-squeeze your footage in Premiere Pro. Find the footage that you wanna de-squeeze, right-click it, and click Modify. Then a sub-menu appears, and you'll click Interpret Footage. Then a box pops up. Scroll down to the pixel aspect ratio and go down to conform to. Then a sub menu appears there. Click 1.33 anamorphic, then click OK. Now drag it onto your timeline, right click it and click set to frame size. That's it, you're good to go, that's the process. Let's talk about the construction. It is very well put together. It's metal construction. It feels expensive. And it only comes in at a price of $4.99, which if you look at the price of what anamorphic lenses go for, they almost always have a comma in their price tag. They're incredibly expensive. So being able to get into the anamorphic world for $500 is actually a new thing. And it's a pretty cool uh, time that we live in. And that's why I pulled the trigger on it because I'm not a full-time cinematographer. I barely do cinematography. I'm dabbling in it, so I didn't want to spend $4,000 on a lens. So I've been very pleased with the results on this so far. I've shot a couple of short films on it. I've shot uh, some behind the scenes, some promo stuff for my YouTube on it, and uh, it produces very good image quality. However, I know a lot of you are interested in the bokeh, so let's talk about the bokeh. Anamorphic lenses are well known for their oval-shaped bokeh, unlike spherical lenses, which give you circular-shaped bokeh. Unfortunately, one of the downfalls of anamorphic lenses is they cannot get as close to a subject as a spherical lens. So for instance, if you're an RF user, this anamorphic lens can only get 2.8 feet from a subject. Conversely, the RF 50mm 1.2 from Canon can get as close as 1.31 feet. And so you're talking about less than half the distance that the Canon can get. Now, I'll put both lenses at 1.8 at their minimum focusing distance, and you can see how much bigger the bokeh balls are with the Canon. However, I do think that the Siri holds its own. Even though it can't produce as big bokeh balls due to the minimum focusing distance limitations, I think it looks beautiful. I think the oval shapes on the outer edge edges are very painterly, very dreamy, very ethereal, and for the money I'd say it does a fantastic job of creating bokeh. So anamorphic lenses are primarily used for cinema. However, you can absolutely use them for stills. Take a look at this gallery. It's all work by my friend, Jordan Grobe, who is a very talented concert photographer based in the Washington DC area. He uses an anamorphic lens as a tool to try to visually recreate what he's experiencing while he watches bands play live. Now he is not using the Siri 50 millimeter 1.8, but he is using a 1.33 anamorphic lens, and this gives you a pretty good idea of what you can expect for stills photography. He just happens to be the best photographer I know of who uses an anamorphic lens for stills, so I wanted to feature a gallery of his work in today's episode. Okay, so I'm sure some of you saw Jordan's gallery, you decided to go out and buy an anamorphic lens, you've taken some pictures, but now how do you just squeeze these images in Photoshop? So if you use Lightroom or Capture One, learn how to do a round trip from Photoshop and back. But in today's example, we're gonna be using Capture One. So we're gonna go ahead and take this file and put it inside of Photoshop. As you can see here, the image is squeezed. It doesn't look quite right. So now we're gonna go ahead and de-squeeze it. First, we go up to image, then image size. And then you see here, you look at the width 
you want to take that number and you want to multiply it by 1.33 because it's a 1.33 anamorphic lens. So I'm going to grab my calculator. I'm going to input these numbers. I'm going to multiply it by 1.33 and I get 22.55. And now when I enter that in, it de-squeezes it and it looks like a cinema shot. You also need to make sure that you have it unconstrained because otherwise it will... Uh, also adjust the height in addition to the width. We just want to adjust the width, which is where the squeeze is happening. And then you just send it back into your raw editor and you're good to go. That's basically how you take a, uh, a still image and de-squeeze it. I also want to give a special thanks to Haley Nicole, who is my amazing model for today's episode. Go check out a link in the description below to her Instagram. So let's talk about the things that I like about it. As I mentioned earlier, it's constructed very well. The price point is very attractive, but most importantly, I think that the quality it produces is really good. Um, is it gonna like be something that's gonna win you an Academy Award? Probably not, but it's pretty awesome looking at 4K to me. I think it resolves really well on my camera. And so I do recommend it if you're wanting to get into cinematography and you don't want to break the bank. It's an absolutely great value. As I mentioned, the focus ring is very smooth on it, buttery smooth as they say, which is good because if you do cinematography and you're using a focus pull system, you want everything to be smooth. If not, you have a poor cinema lens. So things that I don't like about it, so I did mention that the focus ring is smooth and that's great, but the focus ring doesn't have gears on it. And if you're gonna use a focus pull system, you need these uh, these longer teeth to come out. And uh, these longer teeth will be get grabbed by your focus pull system and it'll give you smoother focus from that mechanism. Uh, the problem is uh, I went and bought this ring on Amazon and it's just a little too big so it slips a little bit. I would have paid another $20 for this lens if they just included the gear uh, teeth on the uh, focus ring. So I don't know why they didn't do that. I think that's a serious omission. Uh, I will give you a link to the ring that I bought, but I recommend you maybe buy a size below this and I may buy the size below this. It's about $13, uh, but I'll leave a link in the description below. That's one thing I don't like. The other thing, um, yes, Anamorphic lenses produce lens flare, and that is typical of anamorphic lenses. However, this one produces a lot of lens flare. So it does produce that really cool blue line across the screen. It gives you that beautiful JJ Abrams effect, but it's pretty extreme with this lens. And if you don't like lens flares, I recommend you stay away from this lens because you're not going to like it. It's just like a lot. I would uh, actually uh, be cool with it if they would make a new version of this lens that chills out the lens flares just a little bit uh, because they're still beautiful, but they're just, uh, they can be a little intense sometimes. So so just keep that in mind if you don't like lens flares. One final thing that could be perceived as a con by many of you is that if you want to see what your footage is actually going to look like when it's done, you actually need special equipment to stretch out the image, and therefore you're going to need something like an Atomos Ninja 5, or you're going to need a high-end camera like an R5C, which costs 10 times more than the lens itself. So keep that in mind. It may be a deal breaker for some of you if you need to view what your final product is going to look like in real time if cost is an issue. But if you're looking for a good lens to get you into anamorphic, I would absolutely recommend this. Uh, I'm excited about the fact that they have a 24, a 35, and of course they have this 50, and they also make it in a 75 millimeter. And if you're watching this and you're like, oh man, it's for the RF mount, well, they also make it for the L mount, they make it for the Sony E mount, and they make it for the Fuji X mount. So you can buy this lens for any of those mounts, and the image examples you see here uh, are gonna be pretty similar to what you could probably expect on those mounts. So. Uh, that concludes my review. Uh, I hope you found it useful. Uh, have you bought this lens? How are you liking it? Tell me in the comments below. Uh, if you uh, found this uh, to be useful, I would appreciate it. I would humbly ask you to subscribe to the channel. Uh, click the subscribe button below, ring that bell, and get notifications every time I come out with a new video. Uh, so anyway, I'll talk to you later. Bye.